So today is review day. Um, let's see how big do I need to be? A little bit bigger than this. Let's see. Yeah, that's good enough. All right. Um, so uh, I'll take the first couple minutes to talk about a little bit of logistics for the exam, and then we'll hop into review. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss briefly the main topics um, that we've covered, and then I'll open it up for questions. So the first thing to remember is that the midterm is worth 100 points. This comes out to 10% of the overall grade. Um, logistics wise, um, the exam is gonna be made available at eight o'clock on uh, Monday. And you'll have uh, to submit it by 8 a.m. on Tuesday. Um, and you can, you're going to submit it on Gradescope just like all the other assignments. Um, and you can do it at any time. And you can take as long as you want. Um, so only the PDF is going to be provided. I'm not going to provide a LaTeX template for this. Um, so I recommend you print it out. Uh, it, the exam should be reasonable to take in an hour and 15 minute period. So, um, you know, since you already kind of have this hour and 15 minutes blocked off for class, that would be a good time to just go ahead and take it. Or if you feel like you need to, you know, have more time, you can start early or, or go later. Um, open book, open note, open internet, everything. Um, so what you can't do is collaborate with others in the class um, or post on internet forums or anything like that, um, your questions or whatever. So as long as you don't do that, that it'll be fine. Uh, and I'll be available throughout the day answering questions on you know, Piazza or uh, um, you know, uh, you can email them to me as well. Please post privately during the exam. Um, and if, it, uh, if it's applicable to everyone, then I'll make it public on Piazza. Uh, otherwise, I'll just respond to you privately. Um, OK, any questions before we start talking about topics? Will we have class on Monday? No. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> Should have added that here. Oh, well. Yeah, no class Monday. Well, if you want to just show up in the room and take the exam, that's fine. I, you just, I'm not going to be here. Um, if that makes you feel more psyched for it, though, you could, you could totally do that. Yes, Jack. Uh, yeah, yes. So um, I told Adam to get it graded by Friday. So sometime Friday is when. Uh, uh, so so you'll have it over the weekend, pretty much. Um, and I'll be available to answer questions about about the homework then as well. Um, yeah. The question, by the way, for Zoom was was when is is homework two going to be available? I, I I posted grades for for I think everything besides homework two that has been submitted. So uh, take a look at that if you haven't already. Okay. Um. So let's talk about topics. 
so these are topics for the midterm that you probably should should know about. Um, would you recommend completing homework three as a review for the exam? Uh, it would not be a bad idea to do that for sure. There was a reason that I gave it to you guys early, um, and that was that was for your own benefit. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, I'd say it's pretty decent for you. The question was, would you recommend completing homework three as a review for the exam? And yeah, I, it's a pretty good good review. Um, not comprehensive of you know, what, what may be asked, but um, pretty decent. Okay, so here's how this works. Um, anything that we've covered in this class so far is gonna be fair game. What I've done here is I've, I've taken what I, I think are the main topics that we've discussed um, and kind of, oh, I really shocked at that time, uh, and kind of categorized them into five different sections with a couple of subtopics that I think are pretty important. Um, so anything that you see on this list is maybe even more likely than any other topic that we've discussed to be on the exam. Um, question here, yes. No, and I don't think I'm going to post it online. I think you have to uh, show up or watch the recording if you want this. Um, yeah, so the things that have a single star next to them are going to be even more likely to be on the exam than, than, than everything else. Um, and then double star means it's almost guaranteed to be on the exam. I, I'll say, like, in general, you should expect at least one question from each one of these main categories. And, you know, it is likely that this is going to be involved in a lot of the questions, right? This performance analysis, because that's the point, right? We want to figure out, is this good? Is this bad? So even if the question is about like pipelining, you might have to do some CPI calculation or something along those lines, uh, do some speed up calculation um, as part of that problem. Um, yeah, and the problems are going to be pretty open-ended. Or at least, you know, requiring you to think and then write something about it. Okay. Um, so I, I think at this point, kind of just talked about the general uh, exam itself. I'll just open it up to questions and we can review what you guys would like. Or we can review nothing and I'll go home. Uh, performance equation, where are you? There you are. Okay. Then we'll, we'll talk about TLB after that. And then we'll talk about the four fundamental cash questions. So that'll be the next two topics. Okay, so uh, the performance equation at its core is a mathematical model that allows us to quantify latency in terms of three other parameters. Um, and the first being the instruction count, so just the number of instructions that we're uh, doing on our CPU. Um, again, this is a dynamic instruction count, not the static instruction count. That's important. We don't care about static instruction count very much. Um, cycles per instruction. This is 
necessarily explanatory. This is how many cycles on average it'll take to do a single instruction. And then cycle time is the length of the cycle in seconds. And if you do the dimensional analysis, for example, you have instruction count, which is just your instructions, cycles per instruction, instructions cancel out, which leaves you with cycles. And to convert cycles into time, you, you will multiply by seconds over cycles. Um, I highly recommend, and this is, a, this is a problem that I saw in homework one a few times, was uh, um, people messing up the dimensional analysis. Um, so I just recommend writing out the units. So if I give you, you know, some some numbers, right? Write out 100 instructions and however many cycles per instruction, and just make sure that it cancels out and gives you the units you expect. Um, was there anything specific that you uh, wanted additional review on as far as the performance equation? Uh, yes. Yeah. So cycles per instruction is a ratio. It's the average. Yeah. Yeah. That's very important as well. And also just remember it's cycle time. Um, it's likely that I won't give you cycle time because that's pretty useless or pretty uncommon to see. Most likely I'll give you the, the clock speed. You know, they're kind of uh, in a Hertz value. So Again, that's where doing writing out the units helps. Hopefully you remember from physics or whatever that Hertz is one over S. So then you're like, oh, that's gonna be wrong and invert it. Instruction count changes. Uh, so when the question was basically, when does instruction count change? There's a lot of reasons. Could be the different system, different instruction set architecture, different inputs, different compiler. There's a lot of things that could go into that. Right. So this is a dynamic input, a dynamic instruction count. So if you have an input that's, let's you know, even just come from algorithms, right? Like if you have n of um, uh, one versus n of ten thousand, it's going to be a, a much different number of instructions total. Um, for, for some algorithm, assuming it's you know linear or, or worse or logarithmic, whatever. Cool. Other questions on this? And then we'll hit TLB. What are the broad um, rules again about like what you can and can't compare across different systems? What are the broad rules about what you can and cannot compare? Let's see, do I have a slide on this? Uh, I'll just talk about it. Um, in general, um, A lot of times we can we can just assume that our instruction count is the same across systems. That's going to be a very very common one because we're running it is the same instruction set architecture and the same you know program and inputs and everything like that. So instruction count is is constant. And part of the reason that that is the case a lot of times is you know it's the easiest thing to hold constant. It's the thing that Programmers are really good at. We're able to control instruction count really, really pretty well. Um, we have to rely on electrical engineers to do the other stuff. Um, so, so that's where these ones are probably not going to be as common to be the same across different um, architectures. Um, I would say that the next most common thing would be cycles per instruction. That, that's the next most common thing to hold constant because you know if you have if you have a system and all you're trying to do is compare different clock speeds that's you know you want to hold both these constant um, and mostly if you have the same architecture no, no extra cool extra features on your CPUs um, between systems then your CPI is going to 
stay constant and all you're worrying about is clock speed. So I think those are, I'm not sure that there's necessarily broad strokes, but I think that's a, that's a line of thought you should, you should be going with. Oh my gosh, there's so many animations. Um, yeah, let's talk about, let's just talk about this in, in some small amount of detail. So the next topic that uh, was asked about was TLBs. And so let's get some context of, as to why we need these. So we have this virtual address and we have to decompose it into uh, our page number and our page offset. Okay, so this is just gonna be some number of bits that are the offset, kind of like how we have in, in caches, except for these are gonna be probably much bigger. And then we have a mapping of a virtual page number to a physical page number. And that gives us the actual physical address in RAM to go look up that data. Now. There's a few problems. Um, storing it compactly is the first problem. And we solved that using this hierarchical page table where we kind of have, instead of just one large um, uh, mapping of page, page um, virtual pages to physical pages, instead we have kind of different levels where we can kind of, you know, do a sort of B tree, if you will, type thing, and uh, uh, get get to our actual data via the, these different um, layers of our page table. Now, the other the other problem is how do we actually do the stack? And the you know if you didn't notice from how much time we spent on cast at the beginning of this class, um, a lot of the answers in computer architecture is just add another cache. And this is no different. Um, uh, we're gonna add another cache. We're gonna call it something different because you know we need another acronym to get confused by. But this is called a transla translation look aside buffer. Okay. And the, the idea of this is that it's, um, caching the results of this guy here, of, of traversing this table and finding our page number. Um, so again, it's a cache. Um, it's gonna be smaller than the full memory space because, well, the full memory space is probably huge. Um, and then we have, you know, a few different um, flags, you know, whether or not it's, it's dirty, whether or not it's, you know, um, valid or anything like that. And then each, each, um, each item in our TLB is also going to have a tag, just like in a cache where we have both the index and the tag, the same with the translation look aside buffer. And then we map those to our physical memory over here and kind of, uh, uh, hopefully if we're lucky, we'll have a hit in our TLB. And so our translation to a physical address is gonna be super easy. If it's not a hit in the TLB, we're gonna to have to go and traverse our page table and figure out where in memory or on disk that item is, that data is, okay? Um, Uh, yeah, so so one thing one thing to note here, since it is a cache, we can have hits and misses. Misses are obviously fairly costly. You're going to have to go and actually fully traverse the table, and you also have to make sure that you do a tag comparison. Okay, so just like in a cache where you have both the index and the tag, and you have to compare tags. 
the same thing with the TLG. And most of the time, this is going to be a fully associative or pretty darn close to it because we don't want to have, you know, a bunch of conflict misses in our TLB because of the, the really high cost of, of missing. Um, it's, it's better to incur a little bit more hardware costs and potential hardware overhead uh, to make it fully associative uh, than have to go and pull our page table out. Okay, any, any questions on, on TLB? Yes. I know you said that um, the questions would like, be pretty conceptual and open ended. So, would a version of a question involving the TLB just like, could you speak to that just a little bit more as well? What, what might a question look like? Uh, okay. Uh, well, I have no idea. I'm just being um, you know, Part of what is happening? Stop spazzing out on me on the on the HDMI table. Um, let me think here. Maybe maybe something along the lines of you know there there could be a a, um, a performance analysis question involving the TLB, and you have to know what the TLB does uh, and be able to evaluate how it might affect CPI. Um, that's one option. Uh, another another idea is um, you know even just a question around the along the lines of uh, uh, like maybe giving you a situation uh, where um, you have a specific system. And whether and determining whether or not a TLB is actually useful in that case. Um, again, a little bit more open ended, but I would say in general, even though it's open ended and requiring you to like, you know, do more than just say yes or no, I want it to be backed up by some analysis, some quantitative analysis. So it, the question could be like, you know, given this embedded system that doesn't have you know, uh, that whose memory space is fairly small and we can store our entire page table in cache. Do we need a TLB, you know, stuff like that. Um, that, that would be, that would be fair game, for example. Would understanding how the TLB affects CPI be the same as normal caches affect the CPI? Like a proportion of hits slash misses and the associated CPIs. Yeah, so the calculation would be very similar. Um, you would just have to, to know kind of um, when the TLB comes into play, which is every memory asset. Other questions? Um, I think I think it's in this podcast. Does the TLB does it create, or does it only have upside for speed up? Um, right. Yeah, it's going to, I, I can't think of a reason why it would give a slowdown. You know, the worst case scenario is that we miss here in the TLB. And what do we have to do? Well, we have to go traverse the page table, which we would have had to do anyway. Um, under a, a different system uh, without the TLB. So there, 
you know, there, there's not going to be any any downside to having it a little bit faster. But it could be the same. It could be the same if you have a really crappy PLB that like you know stores I don't know zero lines or something or stores the wrong lines all the time then yeah, you could have zero upside, but that would be like really pretty impossible. You're gonna have like a marginal upside at the very least, most likely. I guess if you're just missing all the time in the PLB and if maybe you have like one line and it's just moving around in your memory, that could, that could, uh, that could cause problems or cause it to just not improve anything. What is the ref bit? Don't worry about the ref bit. Question here, yeah. So, so the, 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 the key to the TLB is that what it's storing is the physical page address, not the actual memory at that page address. So we're only storing an address, and then we have to use that address to go into physical memory. Will I be providing a practice set? Um, I will, well, I'll try and look at the textbook, but I'm not sure that if I'll have time to do that. So is the TLB storing physical address or physical page number? Uh, or the page number? Because the address includes the offset and we don't care about that. Great question. Uh, let's see here. More questions? So let's talk about these four fundamental caching questions. So let's just review what the questions are. First of all, where do we put the block in cache? This is block placement. Um, how do we know if uh, a block is in the cache or not? So this is block identification. Third question is, what happens if we miss and have to replace a block? Which block should we replace? Hopefully you guys are fairly familiar with this after project one. And then what happens on write? So this is our write strategy. Um, and the, the key is that, you know, if, if we were able to make our cache as big as main memory, none of these would be problems. We don't ever have to place, figure out where to place stuff in the cache because, well, our cache is just main memory, it's fine. Uh, we never have to find it in cache because it's just at its index. It's pretty, well, we do have to find it. It would just, you know, it would be a trivial translation. We never have to do any replacements and we never have to, you know, worry about writes. Um, but since our cache is very much smaller than our main memory, we have these problems. Um, block placement, this involves the, the different um, associativities, either fully associative or um, set associative or direct mapped. Um, as we talked about a minute ago, um, it is very common to be fully associative in a TLB, for example. And the reason is that we can put our lines anywhere. We are not constricted to a certain uh, you know, set or, or even just a certain line in our cache. Um, but it's costly. Um, associativity is costly. You know, it's going to take more hardware um, to, to do that. Because we have to compare all the tags in parallel, which is annoying. Uh, 
Um, not going to spend too much time talking about the details because I think that, you know, hopefully you're a little bit comfort, uh, fairly comfortable with with how all of this works from the project. Um, so the next question is is uh, how do we find a block if it's been cached? And this goes to our whole um, uh, address decomposition. And you had a little bit of experience figuring out how many bits are required for each one of these parts in the project. So we have our tag, our index, and our block offset. So the block offset, we just kind of truncate off and we kind of ignore that when we're dealing with the cache because then we'll, until the very end, once we found a line, if we found a line, we use the index to find the set where we're going to store the data. And then we use the tag to determine um, where in the, uh, whether any of the lines in our cache are matching our block dress. Okay, so the di one difference between the TLB and and the you know normal caches, right, is that now we're storing the actual data found at that memory location. Whereas with the TLB, all we're doing is storing our physical page number rather than the full data at that page. So I think it's important to kind of know that this general general uh, uh, concept, right? We have our index bits telling us which set to go to. We have our offsets that don't really matter until the very end when we're doing these final access. Um, and then we have our tag, which we will compare to the tag that we co that come out of that comes out of um, the set. And we also have the valid bit. We also have to know if this, this data is valid, if there's any actual data there. Uh, that's important to check as well. But if both, um, uh, if there's both a, if it's both valid and our tags are equal on either one of these, then we have a hit and we can use that to determine uh, which one to use as our data, okay? Here's another picture of how this works, a little bit different layout, but uh, you can kind of see the offset is only used to determine where in our cache line to go. Um, so any questions on the first two, two things here? I hope, uh, I'm not gonna cover this again because hopefully you should have figured that out from the project. Okay, um, I'm also not gonna spend a ton of time on this because you did this. So hopefully you're fairly familiar with how this works. Um, when you have to get rid of a line, you have to choose the right one and uh, you have to choose one. And then to, there's many different strategies for determining which one to, to choose. And LRU is probably the most common or something similar to LRU like the, you know, in real processors, it's not quite LRU. It's just normally like some pseudo LRU because LRU is actually too expensive to keep track of, which you probably found as you were coding it up. There's a lot of data that has to be stored. Um, so a lot of times what will happen is it'll just kind of, uh, they'll, they'll do approximate LRU for more or less. Um, which gets you pretty close, but not not quite. You're like guaranteed that you aren't gonna ever evict like the most recent or whatever, but you, you could evict something that isn't quite the least recently used. Anyway, um, uh, that's the eviction policy. Then what happens on right? Um, we have two options. We can just write to our cache 
or we can write uh oh i guess there's there's two there's two decisions and two sub decisions underneath it, these uh, do we write just a task for the entire memory hierarchy uh, or should we and then the second question is should we pull the cast line in when we do a write uh, so the first one is the, the difference between um, uh, write back and write through write back is where we only write to the cache and then when we evict then we do the write write through is where we write to the cache as well as to upper levels of memory so we allow it to propagate through and we can make this decision at any level of our at every single level at our cache so we can make a our l1 be right through and our l2 be right back for example totally fine the second question is do we pull the cache line in on a right miss and this this goes to the question of right allocate versus no right allocate if we're right allocate then we do pull the cache line into the cache as we're writing um otherwise you know the no write allocate is fairly self-explanatory you don't do that you just write okay um questions on that I would say a lot of what what I'll test you on isn't so much like what is right allocate because you can just copy from the slides. What it'll probably be is more along the lines of something like you know you're given a specific cache with these different properties, and you'll have to do some analysis uh, of you know performance or something along those lines. Okay, um, the next question. Actually, does anybody who is in class have a, I want to like make sure I'm balancing questions. The next, the next topic that was asked for was bypassing. Anybody else have any questions they want me to cover? Virtual cache dangers. Let's actually do that right now since we're a little bit more fresh on this. And then we'll and then we'll hit the uh, hit bypassing right after. Okay, so what is a danger? Well, what is, first of all, a uh, virtual cache? Well, a virtual cache is when you have the cache being indexed by virtual addresses rather than physical addresses. So the TLB transforms our virtual address to a physical address. Um, so do we do that before or after our cache? That's the question. If we do it after the cache, then we have a virtual cache. If we do it, or if we do it, if we do it, um, if we do our TLB after the cache, then we have a virtual cache. If we do the TLB before the cache, then we have a physical cache. And we have two problems with the virtual cache that we have to deal with. The first of which is context switching. Whenever we do a context switch, we're going to have to blow out our entire cache because. Uh, each program might have the same virtual memory space and we don't want it to be able to access the other programs memory space and we also you know it's kind of bad if you get the wrong data the other one is aliasing which involves uh this concept of having two things mapping to the same uh physical space um so
if we have two pages that are different virtual address locations that have the same physical address, if we cache this, uh, our problem will be what happens when we do a write, when we do a store into one of these. Um, for example, if we do a store here, our cache will be updated for one of these values or one of these virtual locations, but not the other. Even though the underlying abstraction should be that these are both equivalent, because they're the same memory address, clearly they're not, even though we did up, we updated just one. Okay. Cool. Uh, and this was just an example of, you know, why you might want to do aliasing. Hint it was copy on right. So let's talk about pipelining. Hmm. Where? Okay, so first of all, what is a bypass? How did you get a situation with, how do you get in a situation with two different virtual addresses? Yeah, so that goes to this kind of copy and write is kind of the biggest example where um, instead of, you know, the OS or, you know, whatever might, might say, let's just, instead of copying a, a large buffer, let's just point it to the same thing. And then if we ever have a write, then we'll have to do an allocation um, uh, again of, of the actual new modified data. But a lot of times you might just do this mem copy, for example, and then never modify or get rid of the old pointer or something like that. In which case, hooray, we don't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really affect anything um uh as far as um uh the underlying data we're, we're, we don't have to move it to a different physical address um yeah and generally this is you know large copies um and you can also just do this what is this call for example copy and write is used even more heavily in stuff like um file systems where it's really expensive to copy data. So let's just change our pointers in our in our uh, in our file system journal and that'll be that'll be enough. Uh, where is okay so what is a bypass? Bypass is basically allowing us to go from a future part of our pipeline to a past part of our pipeline, if you will. Um, and it's like, uh, it's kind of like forwarding it on to the next instruction, forwarding any data coming out of this to the next instruction. So for example, this is a, an example of a bypass where the, uh, value out of the ALU stage is being sent back into the ALU stage. And this is useful if you need the value out of the ALU stage in the next instruction, because it'll be right there. We, we've gotten it back. If you don't have bypassing, you have to wait for it to do its data memory thing and then to do it right back. And then you can actually do your read stage. So you have to wait until the right back stage is done, which is really kind of terrible. Um, and uh, I posted the solutions to this worksheet. So I recommend if, if you're a little bit like confused on that, then take a look at that and ask any questions regarding you know, why we can bypass in certain cases. Um, but yeah, the idea is just that we're allowed to kind of, um, you know, we can also have a bypass from here over to the LU stage. So if we're coming out of memory, once we get the data read from memory, we can do a, a 
a bypass back to here and then use that in our ALU stage for the next instruction, which gives us a couple extra cycles so we don't have to wait for the write back and then subsequently do a read. Basically, it's like, let's just like fake what was in the, what will, what will be in the register eventually. Again, the, the entire point of pipelining is just to kind of eke out a little bit more performance while still making it look like everything's happening sequentially. You know, we're doing one instruction, it ends, doing another instruction, it ends. Even though like that's totally not how it works under the hood, we want it to always maintain that appearance at least. Um, uh, because otherwise, then we have a non-deterministic system, uh, which would be bad. Though, I mean, everyone uses Windows, so they already have a non-deterministic system. Um, let's see here. Were, were there any specific questions that you had on, on bypassing? that you wanted me to cover. Yeah, the worksheet questions really made sense. Will that be kind of, you know, a similar for at least part of what would be the test questions? I was just kind of overwhelmed by the, the hardware diagrams from this section. So I was wondering how important it would be to review. Um, I think it's important to understand the, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, so the question was like, what of these hardware diagrams kind of do we, do you really have to know? But uh, versus the the worksheet, so I would say, what's what's really important here from this diagram? Well, the the most important thing is that you understand the different stages. So you can see that oh, here's instruction uh, fetch, here's our registers, here's our ALU stage, here's our memory stage, and then we do our write back stage. Like that high level understanding is is key. Um, other things that kind of matter, um, you kind of have to know, you know, that if it's a line, then that means that data is going along it. And so it's kind of like showing you, and then, you know, these, these, these multiplexers allow you to switch between them and don't worry too much about like, you know, what does this mean? Well, it means where do we select our data for the ALU, but I think it's relatively intuitive. You don't have to worry about the terminology necessarily. You just have to know, oh yeah, this is controlled somewhere in our pipeline controller, um, whether or not we're taking the value from the register or from the ALU. Um, so in general, like the red lines are, I would say like less important to know about, you know, and uh, it should be more intu intuition than like, oh, what does, RS1 actually mean. I mean, it, it means like the the S register, the first S register, but it's you could also kind of intuit, oh, it's coming from our instruction. Okay, this must be the register, some register that we're using in in uh, from our fetch. Um, and then. Yeah, I guess. Another key would be the stall. So the, the, the intuition is that like, this is just saying, hey, stop, don't do anything, send a no up through the rest of the pipeline. Um, and you can kind of uh, probably in, intuit that fairly, fairly easily, um, especially from our other, you know, what is our, another diagram? Do we have another diagram? There's gotta be one here, you know? Um, like this, right? So, you know, that red line is kind of representing this idea. Um, yeah, like, you know, who, who cares like a lot for a lot of this? A lot of this isn't necessarily required that you know, okay, what does this circle do? What is, you know, hopefully it's obvious that these do adds, but like, um, it, it, for example, with this, I think that 
the the main takeaway for most of these would be like okay well uh what where do i identify which which part of the pipeline do i we identify that we have a problem and what do we do in that case well we kind of see that we can send a no-op through the rest of the pipeline for example we can change where we get our program counter um, these are kind of the, the the things that you should pull out of these diagrams um, let's see uh go back here is there anything else that i that would be helpful to know about yeah i think that's that's probably pretty reasonable does that help alex cool Yeah, it's, it's important to know for sure, like where where your pipeline stages correspond to, uh, what which parts of the hardware here correspond to which aspects of the uh, of the data path. Um, And if there's a question that involves these, I would say focus on just following arrows intuitively rather than like memorizing what does, you know, what does each one of these things do? Okay, other questions? Oh, uh, also, like, you know, this isn't the only bypass that we could do. As I mentioned, you could bypass from data memory, for example. And you could bypass into the ALU stage for, for this. Um, or, you know, th there's different bypasses that we can perform depending on our situation. And if we, like, have more than one ALU stage or more than one data memory stage, you know, uh, as we had it with our worksheet, then we have a lot of different options for bypassing, potentially, depending on how, how our uh, ALU stages and memory stages are, are configured. Are the homework questions generally indicative of the form of questions on the exam? I would say that any of the homework questions would be good test questions. I do think that there's a few test homework questions that were more like like okay homework two for example where you had to do like all the like coding and such you know probably not going to give you something that long but you shouldn't expect no code at all you know that there should you know there you might have to write a for loop or two um but if you're writing more than that, then you should really stop and reconsider if you're if you're going down the right path for an answer. Can we talk about determining the number of stalls with and without bypassing? Okay, yeah. So let me just pull up the worksheet. I think that's going to be the easiest. Um, So the key is that without bypassing, we just always have to wait until the last stage is finished before we are able to do a register read, because the last thing that we do is write to our register. So if we don't have any bypassing, we always have to pull the data that we need to do any computation out of the actual register itself. Thus, we have to do the, the read after write. Now, 
with bypassing, we don't have that problem. With bypassing, all we need to know is when do we have the data available? And when do we need the data to be available to us in the next instruction? Um, so, you know, the without case is pretty easy. You just have to, you just have to do your register read after you do your register write. The with case is a little bit more complicated because you have to figure out where you have computed the value that you need for the next instruction and where you need it. Um, so in this example, well, and, and you also have to determine if there's a dependent. You know, if this was writing to R7, we wouldn't have any problem. We'd never have to stall. There's no data dependencies between these two instructions. But since there is, since R3 is used in this addition down here, uh, we have a dependency and we have to know when is R3, the value that will eventually be in R3, when is that produced? Well, the instruction is an add. So after the ALU stage, we're gonna know the result of the add. We're gonna know what will be in R3 after this instruction is totally finished. And so we can just say, okay, cool. After the ALU stage, then we'll have the data. The data will exist. We just need to forward it on with a bypass uh, to the next instruction. Now, the next question is where do we actually need R3 in our second instruction? And well, it's the ALU stage. We need it for our addition. So uh, we have to finish our ALU stage for the first instruction before we start it for the second instruction. And I think that, you know, writing out these these kind of diagrams, you know, would be a good idea if you're doing a problem like this. Uh, why did that answer your question? Cool. Uh, and then there was a question about exception handling. What is that in reference to pipeline? Oh, wrong PDF. Um, good question. So, kind of the, the the key with exception handling and you know. Uh, uh, interrupts is that, again, we want to sh make it seem like everything's just happening one instruction at a time. But since it's not, we have some problems. Um, so exceptions are just, you know, when you divide by zero or some integer overflow, et cetera. And you have to handle them when they're detected and the process has to do something about it. But we have to maintain our architectural state so we have to make it look like everything's just happening sequentially. And when we hit an exception, none of the subsequent instructions should have ever modified the state of our registers um, or, or you know, our program counter or anything like that. Additionally, everything that happened before all the instructions that were dispatched before that exception happened need to be committed, fully committed. Uh, an example of this is, let's say you have a floating point multiplication and then a floating point division. And your floating point multiplication for some reason is really long and it takes forever, whereas your division is less time. This makes no sense, but let's just go with it. Um, you know, your division has to be totally finished before, even if your division or your multiplication has to be totally finished even if your division blows up and causes an exception, you know, you divide it by zero or something. Um, so, an example of how this might cause an issue is, is this, where we have, if we have a multi-cycle execute system, 
where you know some different some instructions take many cycles, whereas others only take one in the execute stage. We could have a situation where some of the instructions that happen after an exception are already totally finished, and we've written the values into the register. So we've lost the values in these re these registers before the exception. So that's bad because um, likely our exception handling involves these registers that we just overrode. So that's that's not good. So um, we have two options. Well, three options. We have a bad option, which is just make everything take the same amount of time. So now we have a really, really long pipeline with a ton of execution, but we're wasting a lot of resources on you know these uh, uh, these ads, for example, that that don't really need all of the execution stages. And we still have structural hazards. So we didn't really fix things too. Uh, we didn't really fix things a ton. Another option, which is slightly better, is we can do this reorder buffer idea, which is kind of like a um, it's a way of making sure that our commits happen in order. And we kind of once we are done with our execution, we write to the reorder buffer. And the reorder buffer figures out whether or not it can actually write that a value to the uh, registers or not. So if, if the most, if the uh, uh, if the oldest instruction had just finished, then the reorder buffer would be like, "Hey, we have a value that we can actually write since it was successful." So now we'll just go ahead and write that to the um, register. The last option is, a, is well, so the downside to this is that you have additional latency to this um, uh, reorder buffer thing. And so the other uh, idea is to use a history buffer, which kind of just stores the, the, uh, the history of your um, registers. So you go ahead and just do the normal write back. You assume that everything's going to be fine. But if it's not, then you can use your history buffer to roll back the state of your registers um, if you have an exception. So that's that's what exception handling is in in the context of um, uh, of pipelining. Okay. Other questions? No question. Um, okay. Well, if there are no more questions, I guess we can call it for the day. Um, as I said, try and get the homework by this weekend. And you know, as always, I'm available um, to to answer questions about that. Oh, okay, here we go. Yeah, can we go over the last question from work Sure. Sure. Well, which part of the, last, of the work question is like, 
we didn't actually cover all the material. Or I oh I see worksheet eight, not worksheet nine. Sorry. Uh, this one, yes. Okay, so um, what's the key here? Well, again, we have to know where we where we will get the data that we need and where it um, needs where we need it in the next instruction. Okay, so this is a load from R1. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna get the value that goes into R2 after our memory stages. Okay, so uh, at this point in time, the data exists in our pipeline somewhere. It's not committed to memory yet or committed to a register yet, but it's there. So uh, the next question becomes, where do we need it for uh, our store? And this is a store where we're storing the R3. R3 doesn't, is not reliant on R2. So we don't have any issues where, you know, we don't need it for the ALU stage. The ALU stage only needs R3, which is, you know, we don't have any problems with. It's not, it's not written to by this. And we don't know what the other instructions are, but let's just assume they're all fine. What do we do need R2 for is this, um, this write. We need it as the value that we end up writing to R3. So we can do a bypass from the end of our data memory stage to the beginning of our, the, our first data memory stage uh, for our second instruction. And at that point, you know, we know the address to write to, and then all we need is the data to write. That's what we get from uh, the bypass. Maybe it's useful to look at what this would entail over here in a diagram. Let's go find a good one. So what that would entail is that we, we okay, well, first of all, the pipeline from the worksheet is a little bit more complicated because there's two ALU stages and two data memory stages, but the concept is kind of the same. Basically, we would be bypassing from the end of the data memory stage to the beginning of the data memory stage. Or I guess, you know, that we'd have, it would be like right here. We'd have another muxer just like this that would, it would probably go here to write data. But like I said, I'm not going to be like, you know, I, you, you probably had to do in comp org, you know, draw the arrow that would do the bypass. I, I'm not, <laughs> A, I don't want to grade that. And B, you've already been tested on it. And the concept's more what matters. Um, so just know like, well, the bypass has to go from here to somewhere, one of these ports. Don't really, I'm not, I don't really care that you know which port or, you know, you know, the, the, each thing is going to, it just doesn't, it's not a useful thing to test. What's yeah. What is our, like in the, uh, in the diagram? W, oh, register right. This is also WB in some notations. Right back. So, like the AL stage is like we at the end of the AL stage, we have calculated or you know, derived whatever new value we got. At the end of the DM uh, stage is when we have put that into wherever it should be stored. So or, or read it from. Or read it. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's a good question. So, what is what do each of these stages do again? Uh, where's the slide on this? It's up here. So many animations. Here we go. So WB and RW are the same, you know, th same thing, different notations. Um, but uh, we have our instruction fetch. This is where we go find our instruction from memory. 
and load it in. Then we have to decode it and then grab the operands from the uh, registers. Um, so this tells us which opcode it is and which registers we need to go get data from. This also is the stage where we will tell our pipeline controller, you know, our, our pipeline controller has to do some logic to figure out, you know, whether or not it can proceed. Then ex slash ag slash al alu basically if it sounds like it's doing math that's that's this stage we figure out our memory address or we just do our computation that's necessary for this uh, instruction and then our memory stage which is either mem dm probably not md but who knows uh, I'll, I'll probably be fairly consistent and say, you know, mem or something like that. Uh, that's where we either do a write to memory or a read from memory. And then our last stage is our write back WB. Again, like I said, RW. This is where we store our result, which comes from either our ALU stage or our memory stage. And that's, we store it back to our uh, register. So does that clarify uh, what was going on in the pipeline? Okay, uh, I think that's going to be it. And good luck.